in English, and this is why I'm speaking in English right now. This is one of the highlights of the uh, 11th edition of our festival. Uh, we have a very distinguished guest with us today. Unfortunately, for health reasons, he will be connected uh, from Haifa, Israel. He's not uh, with us today. But let me introduce you uh, to Professor Aaron Kikanover, and I ask you for a big round of applause uh, for him. Thank you. Uh, I'm asking our technicians to please connect us to Professor Kikanover. I hope, uh, good morning, Professor. I hope you heard our applause. Welcome to Trieste Next. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. with you. Uh, before giving you the floor, I would like to briefly introduce our very distinguished guest. Uh, as mentioned, he was born in Haifa, Israel, in 1947. He graduated at the uh, Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. And then as a graduate student, he started working with uh, Dr. Hershko and Dr. Rose on uh, the process that led to the discovery of ubi ubiquitin. Uh, the process of ubiquitin uh, helped, uh, gave a great help in uh, the study of a series of drugs that could be related to cancer and uh, cancer cures. And this is why uh, Professor uh, Kikanover, together with Dr. Rose, Professor Hershko and Professor Rose, were awarded the uh, Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2004. Uh, professor Kikanover uh, is now distinguished professor at the Technion Institute of Technology in Afa, Haifa, and uh, he has received numerous awards apart from the, 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 the Nobel Prize in 2004. Uh, let me just mention the 2000 Albert, Albert Lasker Award, the 2002 Emmet Prize, the 2003 Israel Prize, and then again, the 2004 Nobel Prize. Uh, he is a member of the Israeli National Academy of Science and Humanities, the Euro European Molecular Biology Organization, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, this is a very brief introduction in order to give the floor to Professor Kikanover. Before giving him the floor, let me just thank Professor Pierpaolo Di Fiore, who's here with us today, who helped us in contacting Professor Kikanover a few months ago, and I personally would like to thank him. So, Professor Kikanover, welcome to Trieste Next, and I'm giving you the floor. Thank you again for being with us today. Thank you very much for the introduction and I really apologize for not being able to be with you uh, physically but I promise to do it uh, next time. I know that in Italy those science festivals are being celebrated all over the country. I was in Bergamo, I was in Palermo, I was in Bologna, a uh, beautiful country. Just one word before I start about uh, Trieste. Trieste has a very warm place in the hearts of the Jewish people it was serving as the port of exit from Europe for survivors of the Holocaust that came from all over the Europe after 45 on the way to their newly country to Israel. And actually even my parents that left Europe much before the Holocaust from Poland made all the way from Poland to Trieste and then uh, took a ship to what was then not even Israel, but uh, British Palestine. So. I visited Trieste in the past, uh, not a really thorough visit. It was on my way from uh, Slovenia uh, back to Italy, and I stopped there for two days, beautiful city, and I truly hope to be there uh, soon again. So let me, uh, during the talk, um, give you a little bit briefing on COVID-19, but not from the medical perspective. I'm also a physician, but rather from the ethical perspective, I think that not too many of us uh, think about ethics and medicine, but as you will see from this brief presentation, many ethical issues came up during uh, COVID-19 and Italy was hit very strong by the pandemic, especially Northern Italy, the area of Milan uh, and so on and so forth. So let me start, you see here the beautiful, picture of Haifa, my own city, uh, on the sea like Trieste, 
Um, you see uh, the medical school here where I, my laboratory is, but, but let, uh, let continue. I somehow don't control, okay. So let's talk about several uh, issues that uh, are related to, to the ethics of COVID-19. And one, of course, is treatment priorities. In Israel, but mostly in Italy, in Milan, during the height of the disease, there were many more patients that needed to be put on respirators than the hospitals could accommodate. And the hospitals could not accommodate uh, many patients because of lack of machines, of respirators, but mostly lack of experienced team, expert teams to take care of this patient. So unfortunately, cruel decisions had to be made whom to put on the respirator and whom to, you know, leave aside. Kind of that the physicians became all of a sudden judges, who is going to live and who is going to unfortunately die. And all what I'm going to show you are taken from the scientific literature, nothing from the popular literature. And you'll see here, you know, one article about Italian doctors on the coronavirus frontline face tough cells, tough calls on whom to save. Um, in Israel, we didn't get to this point. We were on the verge in the first wave of the pandemic about making a decision, the government appointed a committee. They put as the head of the committee, a rabbi, a good friend of mine, Abraham Steinberg, who is also a physician, but the committee was made of many representative of the public clergymen, Christian, Muslims, um, philosophers, sociologists, uh, uh, lawmakers, parliamentarians, and so on, to decide how to decide. And certainly the physicians didn't want to do the decision by themselves. They needed the backing of the public, the formal backing of a committee that is approved by the government. And they built a score, a score that is made of several factors, not only the age, of course the age, but mostly other factors, the diseases of the patients, what kind of diseases, what are the life perspectives of the, of the patients, the family state and so on and so forth. And each point got a scoring. And at the end of the day, they summarized the score. But again, you know, there is a red line between people that did pass the score and were lucky enough to put on the respirators to people who did not pass the score and unfortunately were not put on the respirator. So again, you know, we are talking about numbers. We are talking about artificial decisions in many ways, and I can tell you, I'm sure that for the Italian physicians in the Milan area, it was not easy time. And we need to prepare ourselves for the next pandemic because the next pandemic will sure to come. The next issue that came up, and again, I tried to limit myself only to the ethics, are neglected subjects, many diseases, and other issues that on our agenda, like climate change, were neglected. For example, our hospital, I'm in a medical school, I'm a faculty member in the medical school. It's a big hospital, actually the biggest in the northern part of Israel, more than 1,000 beds, was basically emptied, almost evacuated from all other patients. We left only a tiny nucleus to take care of emergency cases road accidents, heart attacks, emergency operations, and 80 to 90% of the hospital became a corona hospital. You can imagine, and it has not been said, you know, specifically, but it did occur that no doubt that the situation of many patients was aggravated. Cancer patients that don't get a treatment, they don't get uh, irradiation, they don't get chemotherapy, cardiac patient, the, the, the catheterization, the imaging of the heart is being postponed. Other situation, I will not go, infectious diseases that are taking, that are being uh, handled at a rush without the appropriate patience and diagnosis that uh, uh, is needed in order to make the right uh, 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 decision. 
and so on and so forth, there is no doubt that many patients with other diseases where their situation was aggravated and, and decelerated. So the question is, why? Who said that corona is more important than cancer, than heart diseases, than uh, gynecological problems, the lung problem, kidney problem, orthopedic problems? You know who said? The public by history, by paranoia. You know, we were surrounded by corona. The news all the days were talking only one word, corona. Physicians showed up in the television. So of course the public pushed for it, the governments pushed for it, and we did not pay attention to other problems. Look at this cartoon about people that are looking at the news at COVID-19, but meanwhile climate change that was put aside, you know, was threatening to drown them. And climate change is not a matter of 50 years from us. It's here, now, this summer. Think about the drought in California. Think about the heat wave in China and in Pakistan and in Europe this summer. Climate change is here. It needs urgent treatment. Think about AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis. Look at the right side that are surging in Africa. Whole campaigns of immunization, of treatment of malaria and tuberculosis were put aside. Look at the hunger line on the left side in South Africa. People didn't get their food because there were no teams to disperse it. There were no airlines to bring the food. Think about how many people suffered because of the corona, because of diverting attention uh, uh, to the corona. And then look about research. The pandemic was delaying by 18 months, research on cancer. You think about how many drugs are entering to the market every year to treat different diseases. A delay in an entry of a very efficient drug against cancer to the market by 18 years, you can measure how much many lives it will cost. Actually, we don't have the number. Actually, we don't want to think about the number. We are not daring to think about it, but think about the indirect damage that the corona caused us, beside, of course, the direct damage of putting people sick and killing millions and millions of them. Then I'm coming to the major point of my talk, and that's vaccination, about skepticism, about misinformation, about availability, about affordability. And I want first to talk about the uh, resistance uh, uh, to um, vaccination. Why people resist vaccination? Why they don't believe in it? What's happening to people that they don't believe in science? You know, people were telling me, you know, I don't believe in science, but I believe in God. And I told them, yes, you are right. God is somebody to believe. You should not believe in science because science is not a religion. Science is a set of testable hypotheses that we go to the lab, to the hospital. We are going to try whether the hypothesis is correct or not correct. There are objective criteria. Science knowledge, scientific knowledge is disseminated among scientists to judge it and to say what is wrong with it and what is good with it, what we shall take out of it and what we should not take out of it. Therefore, science is not a religion. But when people tell me I believe in God and not in science, they mean something else. They mean they really don't believe in the benefits of science, in what science can help them. They don't believe in the hospitals. They don't believe in vaccination. They don't believe in what science is bringing to them. They don't believe in climate change. They don't believe in GMO, in genetically modified organisms. That's what people mean. So let's go to the resistance to, to, to vaccination. See the big protests, demonstrations in the United States. Look at the right uh, lower corner, trust in God, not in vaccines. Look at the middle part, no vaccines, and they show you a syringe for the vaccine. Let's go to the next one because we don't have time. This is a planned on the right upper corner. This is a planned global power grid. The messenger RNA vaccine in bracket made by Moderna and Pfizer will kill millions more than COVID-19. So the vaccination is more dangerous than the disease itself. On the left lower side, cure is worse than virus. The virus is much better than the cure. Where is all this coming from? Where is this distrust uh, in science is coming from? 
two places. One, the medical community itself. Physicians, I bring you one short example. Andrew Wakefield, a British pediatrician, published a paper in Lancet, which is most, one of the most important periodicals in science, where he said that the triple vaccination to MMR, to measles, mumps, and rubella will cause children to suffer from autism, to become part of the spectrum disease. You can imagine what happened. Immediately, mothers in the UK and all over the world stopped vaccinating the kids against MMR. And I can tell you that thousands of kids became sick and hundreds and hundreds of them, if not more, died mostly of measles, which is can be at times a fatal disease. We don't know why Andrew Wakefield did it. We don't know why the editors of Lancet took it, but apparently he convinced them. And look at the books. He didn't uh, settle only for publishing in the scientific and the medical literature. He went to books and he published two books on the issue. People realized immediately that something is wrong here. It cannot be. And billions of dollars and 10 years of research were put into refuting this misinformation. Vaccine ingredients do not cause autism, says one paper. There is no link between vaccines and autism. Lack of association between measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination and autism in children. MMR and autism, further evidence against a causal association. But these papers are scientific ones, and each of them took years to make. And billions of dollars were put into it while people, while children are falling sick with measles and, and, and die and suffering from complications to these very days. Why? Because there is an old say in Hebrew that said that one stone that a stupid person throws into the lake, it will take 100 wise person, 100 wise people to pull it out. And it took, as I said, a long time. And at the end, it's ended. And then a book came, the doctor who fooled the, the world, the discredited doctor hailed by anti-vaccine movement, he still got a lot of, uh, of praise, but nevertheless, the paper was dis uh, uh, retracted from the literature. But again, 10 years, billions of dollars, thousands sick, many hundreds, if not thousands, dead, and many suffering from complications. So we should be very careful at the medical community from this emanating misinformation that mislead the public with grave mistake. Something similar happened in Japan. Another paper by a doctor saying that the vaccination against human papillomavirus, the wonderful vaccine that prevents girls from contracting human papillomavirus that ends in uterine cervical carcinoma causes motor disorders difficulties in walking, you know, limping. Immediately, mothers stopped vaccinating the daughters against the human papillomavirus. I can tell you, I will not repeat it, the same very story that happened with MMR vaccination and, and autism. 25,000 Japanese women. Luckily, it didn't spread much beyond the borders of, China, of Japan, but it did spread. 25,000 Japanese women got human papilloma virus induced cancer of the cervix of the uterus. 5,000 of them are already dead. Many more will die. It's amazing that the legal system doesn't handle such uh, cases. You know, if I will go and murder somebody in the street of Trieste or anywhere, I will be sentenced to death or to life in prison. But if a doctor kills indirectly thousands of people, nobody does do anything. You know, Andrew Wakefield is still free man. He's, you know, living in, in the UK, maybe discredited, but a free man, while hundreds of his victims are in the cemetery. Unheard of that the society will not take steps against it. So you can imagine this one. Now let's go to the next one. The next one is, of course, distrust of the population in the government. 
you know, we typically don't believe in the government and especially underprivileged populations. Let's go to the United States. This is a poll that was made among, let's say, white and black people. Let's forget about all the divisions. Before the Pfizer vaccination came into the market, and the questions were, are you planning to take the vaccines once it will be there? Aren't you sure about it? Or you say, no, forget about didn't answer. Look just at the two lines before the end, the white and the black. White people, 56% said yes. And 27% say that they are not sure. And only 16% said no. Look at the black population. Only less than half said yes. Less than half that the white. 32% that they are not sure. And 40%, almost more than three times than the white population said, no, we are not going to take it. What is the difference between the white and black? The trust in the government. The black people, and rightly so, after many years of discrimination, mostly in the southern states of the United States, I remember very well, I'm old, I remember very well the days of uh, the President John Kennedy, who sent his brother Robert Kennedy to Alabama, to Mississippi, to the southern states of the United States, just to allow busing, busing of black people, uh, black children, along with white children, to schools. People discriminated. They didn't want black people to get on schools that bus, that took white children to schools. Amazing. The black people don't trust the American government. And let me be a little bit more sharp. Let's go deeper into this problem. The Tuskegee experiment. Well, I don't have words in my mouth, in my brain to tell you what happened there. Well, Tuskegee was a small city in Southern United States and physicians, American white physicians, listen to me carefully, decided to follow the natural course of syphilis. What is the natural course of syphilis? You get syphilis and you are not treated. We want to see how the disease evolves naturally. Now, syphilis initially is an easy disease to treat. You treat it with antibiotic. At that time, there was no antibiotic. By the way, I'm talking the years 1932 to 1942, 40 years. But if you don't treat it early enough, the disease, the bacteria, crawls along the nerves, get to the brain, the patient become dementic, like Alzheimer, loses movements, doesn't control any of its body, his or her body's function, and dies in suffering and agony. The American physicians wanted to see how the disease evolves naturally, betraying, no other words, betraying the swear to help anybody on the face of earth without discrimination of gender, religion, color of the skin, any discrimination. 400 black men with syphilis. Look what I'm reading for you on the right side. Were deliberately left untreated so doctors could study the disease. You see on the right lower hand, a white doctor injects to the vein of a black person, what? Water. He told him that he is treating him, but he injected to his veins water. 200 patients died, died. Basically the word died is too gentle to describe what happened. 200 American black people were murdered purposefully by the American physicians. Then in 1972, merely 50 years from now, in the previous century, I was already a doctor. I was already a grown up. It's not an old Roman history of the Colosseum. It's modern human history. The experiment was stopped with apologies of the American government. Later on, President Clinton uh, was also apologizing but what kind of an apologize is that? How can we apologize 
for betraying the very basic oath that we made when we graduated medical school, no excuse, no apologies can be accepted. So now you understand the difference in the poll between the black and the white. The white physicians did not choose white patients for the experiment. They chose rabbits for their experiment, black people. Therefore, no wonder at all, and with my whole heart I do agree, that the black people in the United States are not trusting to these very days, the American government. But in this case, they punish themselves because they don't take the vaccination. So they become more sick and more severely sick and they disseminate the disease. So as you can see, it's like, you know, you are cutting your nose in order to make the mirror angry. You are punishing yourself, but at least, me, as a human being, I do understand the reason. And there were other issues with the vaccination, not only the resistance to vaccination, supply of vaccines to different countries. To these very days, poor African countries, the vaccination rate is very low, while rich countries like Israel, we vaccinated our population very quickly with a very sophisticated computing system. And um, uh, because we could, afford it. And so, and then the issue of, you know, priority, who will get the COVID vaccine first? Children, adults, adults at the risk that have other diseases, pregnant women, what shall we do with them? Do the vaccine endanger them? And so on and so forth. So there are many other issues that have to be uh, solved. Let's go to the next one. And the next one is the infodemic, the misservice of misinformation and disinformation that the media and mostly the social networks did to us. I think that the, it was epitomized by the previous president of the United States, Donald Trump, and his attitude initially to the disease, but also to his very loyal physician, actually one of the physicians that contributed more than anybody else in the history of medicine to public health, to Tony Fauci. Um, but it was not only President Trump, it was also Twitter and Facebook and all the social media that disseminated wrong information. And people, instead of asking themselves intelligent questions and going to a more reliable sources, believed in this information. I will not go into it. I'll show you just two examples. On one one was talking already on President Trump. Um, that said that he happens to believe in hydroxychloroquine and not only in hydroxychloroquine, but also in Clorox, in chlorine that we clean the toilets with as a drug to be injected to cancer patients. And then even Madonna, you know, disseminated uh, all kinds of news about conspiracy that only the rich people have the vaccination and they develop it for themselves and for their friends and they will not give it to the poor people, and so on and so forth. And you can imagine that Madonna has on Facebook and on other, on an Instagram, millions and millions of followers, more than anybody else in the world. So no doubt that she can, with a punch on the keyboard, she can disseminate news at a lightning speed. And people believe it. Why should they believe Madonna? Does she have the information? Is she a physician? Is she is a pharmacologist, but she is being believed by because she is Madonna. That's all. So the misinformation did a lot of damage to uh, the whole campaign in order to encourage people to use the right drugs to go and be vaccinated and so on and so forth. Actually, it was called the disease of distrust. See the left lower side in a science editorial that was published uh, one year into the pandemic in this September of 2020, exactly two years from now. And then the last one is inequality and discrimination and unfortunately racism. You know, we are a very hypocritic society. We behave nicely 
but the nice behavior and the culture and the civilization that we are presenting are very thin. Below it, there is the animal instinct, the hatred, the incitement. And once we are triggered by some economic situation, by a pandemic, by news, the thin shell of so-called civilization is broken and all the bad attributes and characteristics of humankind are coming up. And I will mention only two cases before I close up and, and, and open the podium for, um, for questions. The murder of Floyd, the black person in Minnesota by the white policeman, Chauvin, actually the, the cruel murder when he was pressing his knee against the arteries in the neck of the black person who called for help for his mother, really wanted his mother to come and save him, but at no avail, he was dead. This was the beginning of a big movement in the United States, Black Matter, Black Life Matter. And, uh, and again, the floating of the issue of racism that comes up, that raises its head each time there is a little bit of a shaking of a tension in the society. But amazingly, racism and discrimination does not avoid and even the scientific and the medical community. And here again, from the scientific community, science has a racism problem. We started all of a sudden to count the number of black scientists among us in the United States. And we found that we can count them basically on a, on a one hand finger or metaphorically, there are more than five on one hand finger, but much lower, disproportionately lower to their number in the population. And then again, white senior academics still resist recognizing racism within the scientific community that thinks, that describe itself as objective. And what about women? What about salaries of women? What about women in science? Discrimination, no doubt. But at least the scientific community, unlike I would say the political community has one good attribute. They believe in facts. And once they see the mirror telling them that there is a problem, they take care of it. And there is now a start of a movement to correct discrimination and racism in the scientific community. I can say from our committees in Israel, promotion and so on, we very carefully look into each candidate and we really encourage applications by women and so on and so forth. The problem is still there, but at least we recognize it. There is an insight into it. There is a recognition that it does exist and we are make any effort in order to correct it. So I think the time is over. I want really to, to let uh, the audience uh, come up with questions. And again, apologies for not being with you and physically. All I wanted is to draw your attention that COVID-19 is not only a viral disease, it's a human, a humane disease as well. Next time I will try to talk about more generally on medicine, about ethics in medicine. Ethics is not only in COVID-19, in its every disease, and mostly in modern medicine, in personalized medicine, in modern approach to technologies. People are complaining a lot that the technology makes medicine much colder, much more technological, much more remote from them humanely. It's a very uh, severe problem. And I hope to make it next time to Trieste to be there and to talk about it. So thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kikanover, and uh, I'll kindly invite 
Pierpaolo Di Fiore, Professor Pierpaolo Di Fiore, uh, Professor of General Pathology at the University of Milan and Director of the uh, Novel Diagnostics Program at the Itali um, Instituto Europeo di Oncologia, European Institute of Oncology in Milan. Please, Professor Di Fiore. And also Gabriele Beccaria, uh, journalist and editor at the uh, newspaper La Stampa and also a dear friend of our festival. Uh, we have roughly 25 minutes uh, for uh, discussion. Please, thank you very much and welcome to Trieste Next. Here is your microphone. Thank you very much. For, thank you very much, Antonio Maconi. Do you hear me? Is it okay? Okay. Uh, thank you all, and thank you, Professor Kechanover and uh, Professor Di Fiore. So I suppose that you have many questions since uh, uh, many issues were raised this morning and were summarized in the five uh, major points. Uh, but I know that there are also other many other ethical issues uh, concerning uh, research uh, and uh, we know today regarding um, DNA manipulation and uh, uh, personalized medicine. Um, I would like just to start with Professor Di Fiore if you want to comment about this uh, big problem of uh, the relationship between uh, medicine and ethics and the uh, new frontiers that we have to, to look at on and also maybe to overcome. Yes, hi everybody. Uh, Aaron, can you hear me? This is Paolo. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> I am fine. So... We have, not, we have not met forever. We need to meet. <laughs> uh, of course, it's an extremely complex issue. And uh, I think that to start interrogating ourselves, we should make a very clear distinction. And the distinction is, what are the boundaries of science and what are the boundaries of the application of science uh, to human life? In principle, I do not think that science should be bound in terms of uh, a discipline that allows advancement of knowledge. And this is simply because this embeds the essential nature of human beings. You know, if you think about what makes us really different, is the fact that we are curious. We are not homo sapiens, we are homo curiosus. So, investigating, pushing the limit of our knowledge, is really the best cipher of our nature. So I do not believe that in principle we should limit science. Then, of course, a problem arises when science impacts human life, and I will extend that also to animal life. You know, for a very long period of time, we have been rather insensitive to animal life in the organization, for example, of our experiment, but now there is a new kind of awareness about the fact that in a way, in the same way that we give ourselves rights, because that's what we do as human, we give ourselves rights, we can extend some of these rights to animals for a number of reasons. You know, perhaps this is not the moment to dwell into the reason. And so, you know, we are bound also to limit some extent of human experimentation. So, thinking that science will answer all the problems of human races, I think is a mistake. I think is what we call scientism. But at the same time, believing that we can obscure part of the effort that goes on in science just for political reason is just as dangerous. The threshold, the red line, is of course very difficult to identify and is the terrain in which all component of society should pitch in. I don't think that decisions concerning scientific issues that affect human life, animal life, 
the planet should be left only in the hands of scientists. From that point of view, science are just part of the constituency, are just part of the stakeholders of the system, but the system is much bigger and much wider than the scientists. Professor Chekanover, uh, good morning. Can you comment on this big issue? <laughs> What's your opinion yeah. about that? Yeah, well, I think that uh, Pierre Paolo really defined it very well. First of all, let, let's try to isolate scientific achievement for a minute and, 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 and give science the right credit. And uh, not that Pierre Paolo needs it, he knows very well about it, but, uh, but you know, 120 years ago, at the turn of the 19th century to become the, 100, the 20th century, people were living about, on the average, 50 years. They died of infections, there were no antibiotics, there were no operations or barely surgery, there were no x-ray. Actually, x-ray, if you remember, was the first Nobel Prize given to Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. Of course, there was no uh, MRI, no CT scan, there was no vaccination. We, didn't, we couldn't vaccinate people against polio, against measles, against rubella, against cholera, against corona, against anything. There were no vaccinations, no antibiotics, no nothing, basically. The penicillin came to the world only towards the end of World War II. People died in the field from tetanus. Women died during delivery. In order to have a family of three children, the woman had to deliver 12 because eight were dying in the first year or two to their life. See what happened in one century. We are now living on the average 85 years in the developed countries. Women a little bit more, men a little bit less. We extended life expectancy by 60%. We jumped from 50 to 85. Let's look back at the 4,000 years that spent at the time between the old Egyptians and Romans and Greeks and then Romans, you know, you know just 2,000 years ago to nowadays. The Romans were living about 35, 40 years and life were extended in long 4,000 or 2,000 years by 15 years only. From the Roman time, to the 20th century, people extended their lifespan from 35 or 40 to 50. And then in one century, 5% or 10% of the time, we managed to add 60%. Why? Because of science and technology. Only science and technology. Vaccination, imaging, antibiotic surgery, diet, sport, communication. We are able to talk to one another like we are talking now. All those came together in order to extend life and we are still have not reached the limit. So that's science. Now we are coming to science and society, the limits of science and should we limit science? And of course the questions I can accentuate them. You know, we don't want to clone people. Let's take it to the extreme. We don't want a factory that will make new Nazis that will come from the ground and will bring with them new ideas and new destruction. We have enough of them already walking on the face of Earth. You know, gene editing to change the characteristics of people, to improve it or to make it worse. You know, what are the limits of science? I don't have a clear answer for that, but I do believe in democracy. I do believe in freedom. I do believe that democratic regimes are not the ideal, but they are optimal. Within a democracy, there are lots of opinions. There are checks and balances. There is the parliament, there is the president, there is the government, there is the juridical system. I'm sure that my students will not do any experiment that looks to them immoral, even if I tell them to do, even if I am their boss. My funding agency, the EU, will not fund any experiment that is beyond what they believe and we believe are the moral limits. So yes, we should limit science to the borders of morality, but we should be very careful, you know, to define these borders 
So we shall not hit and we shall not hurt and we shall not damage the progress of human beings. And even our curiosity should be limited. I'll bring you another example where an interesting question, very interesting question, in my opinion, should not be investigated. The IQ, the intelligence of different ethnic groups. Can you imagine that we are now going and studying the intelligence of different ethnic groups all over the world, doesn't matter. I don't want even to go to, to a country. And can you imagine that the result of this study will come up with the result, with the findings that certain groups, let it be men or women, let it be black or white, let it be Christian or Jews, let it be whatever, is inferior to another group. We are shaking the very existence of the pillars that holds the society together if we are at all united society. If we want to destroy society, let's go and ask this question. Now, this question is very interesting. You know, what is intelligence? What is the source of the intelligence? Is it inherited? Is it acquired? Is it a mix of the two? Is it affected by education? Does education have any effect on it or we are putting millions of dollars in education for nothing and some people have natural intelligence? I mean, it's an awfully interesting question, but we should not touch it, at least not as related to ethnic origin. So it shows you that the border can be in the twilight zone, that we cannot do whatever we want because not only we are endangering our very existence, but we may seed, you know, we may implant trees of hatred, of incitement that might shake the very existence of us as a society. So science is not a distinct part of the society. It is the society. It is for the society. It is made and carried out by the society. Me, Pier Paolo, all the Italian scientists, the wonderful woman um, uh, that I know, Rita Levi Montalcini, who was my very good friend, we're part of society. We are working for the society, driven by our curiosity. We are not a different part of the society. We are not separate from the society. We are working within the society and we should be very careful all the time to pay attention to this very sensitive issue of the interaction between what is allowed, what is not allowed, what role we are playing in the society and be very careful not to harm and not to damage. So science and society and this system of checks and balances, um, I would like to, to listen from you any question that you have because I'm sure that we have a unique opportunity to, okay, please, do we have a microphone? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask something because before we talk about availability and affordability, so I wanted to ask an opinion about patent because we saw a lot also during this pandemic how patent for vaccines uh, were made and obviously pharmaceutical industries want to make money from what they obtain, but having these prices for uh, drugs, vaccines, whatever, makes a um, breach, a barrier for countries that cannot afford this. So it's kind of a, a form of uh, division between who can afford medicine and who cannot. Like how can we manage to balance this out? So in order for both the companies to get a compensation for their ideas, but also for everyone to get the cure they need. So I wanted to ask an opinion on that. I'm, I'm not sure, can, can you reformulate it briefly? Because I'm not sure that I got the essence of the question. It is more to ask an opinion on this difficult topic, which is the patent in, in science, mainly in medicine, because both, there is both the aspects of the companies that wants to get money out of it, so they yeah. have the patent, but having the patent may, uh, makes um, not makes the drugs not affordable for everyone. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, 
It's a very good question, and I, I and I'll try to expand it. Um, first of all, you know, I didn't go into personalized medicine, but drugs are becoming more and more expensive, especially drugs for rare diseases, for orphan diseases. And there is always a question what to do. Israel, I, I just want to bring you one example briefly. Uh, Israel has a, a committee that every year decides about the budget that will go to new technologies and new drugs. And the budget is limited. You know, budget is always limited. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter how. So the question is, you know, there is a rare disease, which is called spinal, spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. It's a disease in children where the muscles are degenerating and they are gradually losing the, their ability to walk and then to breathe, and then they die. There is a modern treatment that is using molecular biology, editing in order to correct the, the gene that is affected. The treatment costs about, depends whether it's chronic or not, about, I would say, well, now the euro is a little bit below the, the dollar even, about, I would say 200,000 to 250,000 euros per kid. Now, with this sum, you can buy 250 respirators, or maybe a little bit less. You can hire physicians, you can hire nurses, you can open new department, you can buy beds, you can do a lot of things that are much cheaper. So how the committee, how, how to weigh the life of one kid versus the lives of 100 elderly or, or other kids that are sick with much less complicated diseases. How do you do it? I mean, how, 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 how you can evaluate the value of life? How much life worth it all? Then we come to your next question, and that's the company. At the end of the day, the companies are those that develop drugs. And you might ask yourself whether this is right, because the companies will develop drugs only for certain diseases. And let's be, you know, honest about it. They will develop drugs only to very common diseases, not to rare diseases, heart, cancer, and so on, and to chronic diseases. They will not develop antibiotics these days. You know why? Because with antibiotics, you take the antibiotic for 10 days and you are done. This is not the money for them. They want you to live long with the disease and not be cured from the disease and not die from the disease. They want you to be chronically ill because then you'll take the drug forever. You will take statins to reduce cholesterol forever. You will take drugs to reduce your blood pressure forever, not forever, for a long time. So their cashier, their cash flow, will keep on uh, throttling. So, um, so this is the issue. This is the issue with the companies. Then you ask yourself, what is it, what's going on here? The Italian government and the Israeli government and the American government, doesn't matter, governments of advanced countries are taking the tax payers' money and invest it in our very basic fundamental needs of life, infrastructure, roads and bridges, education. Education in Israel, elementary and high education is free. Uh, almost free. No, I mean, elementary education and second high school education is free and universities are almost free, almost. And defense, they fund the military. My military protects me. It costs billions of dollars a year. They build hospitals. In Israel, we have a very good public health system. They build the hospitals, but they don't interfere with the drug industry. How is it that they pay the salaries of the doctors and the nurses, and they build the buildings, but they don't care about the drugs that are being dispersed within the building? They have no, have no say. Maybe it's time for the governments also to dictate and to incentivize drug company in order to generate drugs that are less profitable for them or to make public companies like the military is public, the educational system is public, the health system is public, maybe to support also the pharma company by converting it partially to be public so they will now 
start to generate drugs against diseases that are less money-making. Think about malaria. Millions of people are sick with malaria, but where are they? They're not in Rome, they're not in Florence, they're not in Paris or in London or in New York. They're in Malaysia, in Vietnam, in Africa, in countries that cannot pay a penny for the drug. So who cares about malaria? It will not bring any penny to them. They will not make any drug. You know, all the drugs that are being studied against malaria are done either part of charity, okay? The companies want to look green in the eyes of the public or, you know, part of the academic studies in universities that will never be commercialized. So here is another question. So you're absolutely right. We should pay attention to the money issue. One, to the public money issue and how to disperse it between a very rare disease for one kid versus the lives of hundreds of other patients and to what the companies are doing. But, you know, it's, um, it's an excellent question that I don't have a magic answer to it, but I think that uh, the public and the political echelons should really push at least to start thinking about it. Professor Di Fiore, what's your opinion about this enormous issue of drugs and their prices and their availability? Well, I, I do concur with everything that Aaron said, and uh, I would like to add that this is just not an economical and political issue, but if you want, there is a very strong moral ground on which the request to lower the price of drugs could rest. The moral ground is the following, that of course pharmaceutical companies invest a lot of money to develop drugs, but they invest money based on the enormous knowledge which is accumulated in public research institutions by money which is paid by government to incentivate basic science. So for every little advancement which is being done in the applied field of science, there is an enormous effort from behind which is completely paid with public money. Every worker in a pharmaceutical company has been trained with governmental money for most of its career, certainly in Europe, partly in the United States. Every patient that participates in a clinical trial contributes in the name of humanity to the advancement of a certain field. So this is a social dividend that should be reclaimed. It's a social dividend that should be put on the table and said, fine, you invested $2 billion to develop this drug. We estimate that the global investment of public money was $10, $20 million. So how do we deal with this? If it has to come to economics, let it come to economics, but let's make our calculation right. The $2 billion per drug which are paid by the pharmaceutical company is a minor part of the global investment. The big part is actually happening on public money, through basic re research, through education, and through a public dividend that humanity contributes with experimentation from patients. So let's be clear. When government don't sit down with a pharmaceutical company and put their fists down about controlling the price of drugs, they are allowing a transfer of money from the public to the private without the citizen knowing it. This is something that should be clearly spelled out. I'm not saying that the drug companies are the bad guys. They do a job that nobody else could do. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be making money out of it. I'm just saying that you know, there is a tax that they should pay because they've been using the public system in many ways which are not apparent, but they are determinant. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we have time for one more question, and I see a hand raised down there on my right. It's, can you bring a microphone there? First of all, uh, I want to thank the professor for his very clear and engaging presentation. Um, so as you said earlier, uh, um, today we know for sure that there is absolute, um, absolutely no correlation uh, between vaccination and autism in children. So this means that uh, uh, Mr. Wakefield's uh, uh, initial uh, research uh, must have been uh, uh, deeply flawed. How is it possible that um, such a paper was able to pass um, the strict uh, pre-reviewed uh, process of Lancet? Uh, um, is the process inherently flawed? Uh, uh, should we come up with uh, new ideas on how to evaluate research, uh, or was this just an isolated case? Thank you. Well, you are touching on every single sensitive issue in science, amazing. Um, it's an, again, it's an excellent question. It's not only Lancet um, and the editorial board and uh, it, it, it has to do with bibliometrics and fame and what drives the, the editors. And uh, in the case of uh, Lancet and, and uh, Horton, the editor, I think that they, they were, of course, they were not careful enough. That's, there is no doubt about it. The damage that they caused is amazing. You can imagine. But I think that they were after fame, after public attention, after raising their stakes, their, their you know, whatever, the, the impact factor of the journal, S uh, publishing something sexy, controversial, that nobody that came from nowhere, from, from a hidden place. Hard to say, you know, and there are many other of them. You know, I, I don't want to go into details. I remember Nature, many, many years ago, um, published papers of, um, um, on, on dilution. You know, that if you are diluting a, a compound beyond one molecule, you know, beyond the Avogadro number, I don't want to go to chemistry, it still has an impact on the water, the, despite the fact that there are no molecules presented of the molecule that was diluted. Think about... Uh, even, uh, you know, the late Nobel laureate who discovered the AIDS virus, Lac Montagnier, or, or, or Doisberg that, 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 uh, that published all kinds of things about, that had no place in, even not in imagination. You know, Doisberg, for example, you know, played into the hand um, of the people that, uh, that, uh, that completely denied the existence of the AIDS virus. They said that this is a, a disease that was sent to us from God. It has nothing to do with the virus. You know, in, in, in South Africa, the prime minister or the president at, at the time that came after Mandela joined this uh, misinformation and said, look, the virologist are, 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 is saying something about it. So, so what, who we are? Um, uh, so, um, um, uh, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the periodicals should be very much careful about uh, what they publish. And, uh, you know, everything should be tested under the eyes of many reviewers that come from different fields, especially when it comes to very controversial um, um, finding. Yeah, we shouldn't block controversial finding because, you know, th these, are, these are the ones that are revolutionizing and, and make science progressing. But on the other hand, we should be very careful about the damage that it can cause. And let me just add very briefly, because time is really running out, um, the issue of bibliometrics and, you know, the impact factor and what makes a, a periodical uh, important, so on, something that I don't believe at all, maybe Pier, Pier Paolo will be able to add something about it. Um, um, they, the journals are really... Um, looking inside. They are not looking outside. They are looking for their own interest. And you are taking the big ones um, that, that are cited by many scientists. They are make, it's a money-making uh, issue. Take, for example, Cell or Nature. Each of them is publishing not only Cell and Nature. They are publishing 100 other journals under the name Molecular Cell, Cell Genetics, 
cell plane, uh, and, and so on in nature of this, and nature of this, and nature of you, zero, and nature of you. It's an industry. And you are paying, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing. When I publish a paper, you know, my institute is a public institute, like the universities in Italy. The money for my salary is coming from the public, from the taxpayer. Every experiment that I'm doing in the lab is coming from the public, the money for it. Then once I'm publishing it, my university has to pay to a private organization in order to see what I published. They subscribe to Nature and Science and Cell, and they're paying millions of dollars a year in order to see the papers what, that was already paid for by the public. And the public has no access to it. Only the universities have access to it. The public cannot see what they already paid for. Therefore, there is a big movement nowadays for what we call open access, that everything will be open. You know, it, it's the public property. We should not deny the public from having completely open access for it. But the scientists themselves, that's what I said, the medical community, when I brought the example of Wakefield and, and, the, and the resistance to vaccination, the scientists themselves are objecting it because all, all of a sudden, the tool, the weapon that makes them famous by publishing in high impact factor journals will be taken from them. It will not exist anymore. Everything will be open. It will be, you know, there will be no journals. You will publish on the internet. A long time people will say this works for something or doesn't work for anything. And the incentive of many scientists to remain in science rather than being curiosity, than being famous, will be taken away. So there are huge discussions with the, within the scientific community, what will be the optimal way to go on one hand with the rich publishers, on the other hand with their own fame. And the fame is not only the fame of a Nobel Prize or something, that, forget about it. The fame is about promotion, becoming a professor. The fame is about getting a grant from the EU. The fame is about being cited many times. The fame is about being invited to conferences, how people know about you. How do they know that I'm famous? By, by saying, by seeing that I published in the leading journals, by seeing that I'm cited by many, they start to invite me. And after the first invitation comes the second and the third, and it's like an avalanche and so on and so forth. So part of the problem is within the scientific community that is reluctant to give up on the tools and the weapons that they have in order to curtail and to really curb this problem. Thank you very much, Professor Chekanover. So unfortunately, our time is over. So we thank you a lot for all your extraordinary and interesting remarks. So we hope to see you next time in person here in Trieste Next. We are okay. waiting for you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And All the very best. Thank you very much. Aaron, Thank you. Happy Rosh Hashanah. And thank you, Professor Di Fiore. And thank you, Antonio Maconi. And thank you all. Grazie. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Thank you. Grazie a tutti. Buon pranzo. E Trieste Next continua nel pomeriggio. Trieste Next will continue in the afternoon. Thank you.